believe me, I'm doing, doing my best uh, female Dracula voice or whatever uh, for Halloween. It's a Halloween special and um, nobody's more, uh, nobody's more goth than the Victorians. And I have an example of a really cool Victorian uh, jacket with beads on it. And it's all black for, uh, for a fine Halloween treat here. So I will just get the close-up camera on this this guy and do a screen share. Get it. Um... Ah, there we go. And it looks like it's in focus. Hooray! So um, I'll probably title this: uh, "The Victorians Were More Goth Than You'll Ever Be." Not that you necessarily want to be goth, but what the hey, right? Um, first of all, before I even get into the beads, the lace on this piece is exquisite. And because I have white person skin, uh, even if I didn't, you could see the black lace design over my skin. And it is multi-layered underneath this layer. And this is the bottom of the sleeve. You peel it back extremely carefully because this piece is well over 100 years old. Here's another piece of lace. Under that is a silk sleeve. And inside, let's see. Yeah, you'll see the inside in, in a minute. <clears throat> but uh, the... The lace is just exquisite. This is not something you'll find in Joanne Fabrics. I, you know, Joanne Fabrics is great, uh, craft stores, whatever, Michaels, um, uh, whatever other ones there are out there. Um, this is lace that probably was handmade. I remember, I think it's in a Louis Ferdinand Celine book, uh, this French author really wild guy he's he was talking about a family of lace makers and they only ate noodles because they didn't want they worked at home and they didn't want the smell of food to permeate the lace that they made and sold this is so old that if there is any food smell to it it's long gone but yeah lace one lace two See if I can get you a better image of it. <clears throat> and again, uh, wow, this is uh, it's it's kind of like um, this is almost more netting than lace, but I guess netting is a type of lace. Who knows? Now I'm going to peel this back very carefully because again the the it's a hundred years old and. It's made out of silk and silk rots. Um, this is the lining. And you'll notice that there are hooks and eyes to hook the front together. It's, this goes all the way down the bodice and the front. And this is the, the, the bodice, I guess you'd call it. Um, they had sewing machines in those days, but much of the work was, of course, finished by hand. These are what they call stays. They made it so that the uh the the shaping was correct it's it's this type of thing was uh was used in also in, in uh, girdles and you know uh, undergarments let's say this might be a newer fabric it feels different it doesn't feel like the silk that's on the rest of this piece at all and look at this wonderful this is cotton this is made other than this piece potentially, before any synthetic fabric was was invented. The reason I brought up, and I, I love that little pattern too, don't you? The reason I brought up the hooks and eyes was because again, the the zipper is a, uh, was not invented till after this was, was made. I do remember my grandmother who with my grandfather operated a general store in the 1930s in a town called Birkenfeld, Oregon. 
they she said that it wasn't until the 1930s that she first uh, started selling zippers at the store. I think zippers, I can look it up, was were invented before that, but they were talking about commonly in use in a an obscure uh, Oregon logging town, right? Not the um, not New York City, not uh, not Milan, uh, not in London, but a tiny town in Oregon. So again, um, this piece probably dating from the 1890s right here predated even the uh, the well the the introduction of the zipper to clothing. So with the, on that happy note, I will get through, I will show you some more lace because there is more lace that is different on here. And let's see. Oh yeah, this actually, this lace resembles the lace that is under on the sleeve cuff under the overlace from the sleeve. So not the almost netting lace, but the possibly even more delicate lace that's underneath that on the sleeve from just above the wrist to the wrist. And that goes down the side of the bodice in front. Then we have, well, why not? Because we can, we have, now the this lace goes, I'm not gonna shove my hand up here because I don't wanna damage it, but the lace, show a little bit of it. The lace I showed earlier goes all the way up underneath here to the shoulder. And then on the shoulder, there's, you guessed it, more lace. And this is the same type of lace that's going down the front of the bodice and at the wrists. And again, uh, I don't know if this was done by hand. It may have, uh, I know they had sewing machines. I'm not familiar with the history of lace making. But yeah, back in the day, people did all this by hand with needle and thread or a, a special type of needle and thread. Um, makes my beadwork look like, makes me feel like a slacker. What can I say? Now, this is ribbon. This is right here. See if I can get it to, there you go. Now the, the lighting corrected itself. You can see the ripples in that. Uh, it's kind of a sutash type thing. It's not exactly sutash. It's a treatment of fabric so that it looks, there we go, back to lighter exposure, good. It has kind of a wonderful rippling effect. And yes, those are little beads. And these are, now I'll finally get to the beads. These are beads that are sewn to the fabric. And let's see. I will be careful with this. Maybe I will move this part up. Yes, the, the silk is rotting. That's one of the reasons I have to handle this, for, uh, handle this nicely. I confess, I after I found it, at a, some sort of sale in Portland decades ago, I, I was able to wear, I wore it a couple of times. The waist did not fit because I did not have a 20 inch waist. I don't think, I th don't think I've had a 20 inch waist since I was a child, but the shoulders just fit. Since then I have decided not to, well, I'll put it this way, I didn't party in it. And I would not, I would probably not only not party in it now, I probably not, would not put it on now. <clears throat> but in any case, because, you know, again, it's delicate. Uh, it's well made, as you can see. But like I said, silk rots. This is cotton. But silk is on the outside. And silk rots, lace tears. What can we say? So in any case, this might be missing a bead right here. Ah, my overly white hand, overly white skinned hands are making this harder to see. Now, now that the hands are gone, the exposure is better. You can see the exquisite beadwork uh, that had to be done by hand, uh, needle and thread. They had to sew each bead on there 
and they had to sew it into a pattern and they did a fabulous job, what can I say? So I'll show you a little bit of the other half after I carefully, carefully move it. It's basically the same on each side, roughly the same. <clears throat> there is a, a little collar. This collar is sewn down. Is it sewn down? No, it's not sewn down on this side. And if you look under here, the this is actually translucent. So we're looking at some lot of design elements here. Uh, this one is sewn down. I'm not going to prove that to you by messing with it further. However, I will show you just the other side of the full. Let's see. Let's see if I can get a better. View of the bodice. Oh well. And what can I say? It's a, a gorgeous piece of work. Now, design wise, as you can see, there are tons of elements. I mean, we're talking three types of lace, not counting the inside that's not seen when worn, three types of fabric, at least for the collar with the trim. And at least two types of uh, beads, seed beads and the bigger beads sewn onto it. And so they're, you know, Victorians were known for piling it on. Uh, if you go a couple decades later in history, you'll find that the Art Deco era was eschewed all that type of design aesthetic, said, oh my God, I'm sick of people piling it on. I don't want a million figurines on my mantelpiece and overstuffed horsehair chairs. I want clean, simple lines. So most people, uh, despite various revivals in the 20th century, grew up with those clean, simple lines in their home, not Victoriana. Um, and a, as usual, the preceding style is always there's a kind of a seesaw effect. Uh, you get you get over the top with the decorative aspects and the uh, piling it on thing, and then you go, and then next thing you know, people are like, we're sick of this, let's do minimalism. And then people are like, um, this minimalism is a little cold, let's get cozy again. So the seesaw goes back and forth. Now, I'm going to carefully remove this from the surface, the, uh, the floor show here, so to speak. Sorry about that light coming from the top, but I'll show you some of the beads that the types of beads that were featured in clothing in the Victorian era. <clears throat> My dear departed friend, uh, Jeannie Bard had a wonderful bead store on the Oregon coast in the eighties and nineties. And she loved this stuff, and so did I. So I, um, I think many of these I obtained from here. There's another wonderful vendor. I don't know if he's still around. I hope he is. Uh, named Ben Eagle. He was doing uh, the big bead shows, and in the probably 80s as well, as well as 90s and early 2000s. I haven't seen him in a while, but he has exquisite things and he's a cool guy as well. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it too well. Let's see. Ah, I wish I could show you the texture on here. Let's see if I can get this puppy down further. Okay, the lighting is not as good as it could be. I think due to the contrast, maybe what I'll do is scoot things down off of this white plastic surface and I will have a wood surface underneath so it will there will be less contrast and you'll see the pieces better. Let's see if I can do this here. 
goes on to the wood surface. Ah, a little bit better. Maybe not. Let's see. There we go. Yes, you can see some contrast. I'm happy about that. Okay, so I will work with this portion of my table surface here. Yeah, you can see now, these are from the same batch of beads. And ah, I wish you could see it better. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. You can see that some of these are totally flat. That's why you have that reflection there. And some of these are nebulae. Well, it's all the same bead. It's just that on one side, it's uh, one side it's nebulae. And with this one, you can see it. The other side is flat. They call those nail heads. I did a, a few videos on nail heads and the incredible variety of them and what you can do with them. And it's worthy of a, a big long show in itself. Uh, the variety of these is astounding. They went super tiny. Um, Let's see. These are actually beads, regular beads, not nail heads. They don't have that flat surface on the bottom. But the upshot is that the nail heads were actually meant to be sewn onto clothing, such as the Victorian piece I showed you, and the and hats. Now I'll show you too. I think you get tiny. Look how tiny these are, and there is a faceted side on them too. So, and they were, I mean, some of them, yeah, indeed were as goth as you want to be. The nail heads came into vogue during the Victorian era, I believe. And you can get, I mean, like I said, goth as you want to be, coffin shaped ones. Um, here's the flat side, the, the, the faceted side has, as facets is has a shape to it, and they're all press molded. So, long story on that, but again, uh, the variety. And by the 1920s, they were still doing. Um, they were still making nail heads. They just started making them in colors. And you see that's that satiny sheen on there. That's the. That's the unflat side, the, the, the bar relief side, and it happens to have a bunch of little miniature lines running down across it. And I believe this has, let's see, I'd have to look at it with my reading glasses on perhaps, but I believe this these all have two holes in them. Again, two, the two holes mean you can really nail it down onto the fabric or whatever surface it is that you're using, the fabric or the felt of the hat that's, that it's going on. Now, here's an oddball. That's a same shape, but different top on it. Uh, faceted, not, not, uh, not the little tiny lines, but I must have it in there for a reason. And the... The variety was just incredible. What happened was by the 1950s, it was out of style. So these, there, for a while, there were warehouses full of these gorgeous little beads, sitting, uh, rotting, uh, you know, not being, not being purchased. Look at the texture on these. Look how much work went into that. They had to carve. They had to make molds that allowed this these shapes and sizes to happen. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of effort was put into it. A lot of beads were purchased and used and a, a lot many a lot more, many more many more were not used, sat in warehouses and people like my friend Jeannie Bard so, uh, got excited about them when she saw them and bought them whenever she could and put them in her store and so on. And same with Ben Eagle. He, would make a trip to the East Coast where a lot of these pieces were imported into. Um, and they would, 
they would just dig through these basements and find these beads. I'm going to show you a sample card from a wholesaler in New York City that was in business for over 100 years and probably, I believe, is still in business now, where many of these came from. They also, because they're in business that way, they have sample cards that they worked with. I'll be right back. And by the 1920s, like I mentioned, Victorian, goth, black, every, every, any color you want as long as it's black was out and color was in. So this is a sample card showing nail head beads from the 1920s. What's great about it is that it has their 15 West 37th Street, I believe, address on it, which dates the the dates this to a certain time period because they change locations and they have the date of the location change. But basically, yes, all these these four different shapes were available in all these different colors. Um, you could order them by the color number. Twenty six is white, etc. Um, 121 is orange, so on. That's consistent uh, from the, from here. You know, 154 is tan. Here, 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 and here, and so on. Uh, 208 is green. And what I find really thrilling about this, and this is a wonderful gift from Jeannie Bard. R.I.P. Rock on Jeannie. Yeah, behind the veil. Speaking of goth and and all that Halloween stuff. Um, uh, yes, yeah, she, she's gone, but she, her beads rock on and her inspiration rocks on. So I'll tell you the really intriguing part about these. And again, these all, you know, these show the number of the, the part number, basically. But these in particular, and I will get closer to them so you can see, these are little spider beads. Or, uh, well, spider motifs, and there is a uh, there was a, an Egyptian revival period at that time because the discovery of well the looting and, and the unfortunate looting of the antiquities in Egypt, and also the the putting on display of the contents of some of the pyramids or the uh, some of these ancient Egyptian tombs really thrilled the public, uh, got their imagination going, and it was reflected in beads. Um, you'll find, oh, look on eBay and Etsy, you'll find lots of Art Deco era uh, jewelry made in Czech Republic with sphinx heads on it, with all kinds of, you know, the Egyptian motif things. Now, uh, nail heads, and that included nail heads, not just regular beads for necklaces, but nail heads that could be sewn on to very trendy clothing for 1922. And that includes these guys. Again, I'll carefully do this. See the flat bottom? It's a nail head. But, uh, what can I say? And I was thrilled to discover that because I found when I went to, when I had the privilege of visiting uh, the Czech Republic in 2006, and I believe it was 2011, um, an antique store that had beads. They had these World War II ammo boxes full of basic uh, romps, they called it, which is basic like uh, beads that are either rejects or partially broken or just part of, you know, some beads were viable, but some beads were not, that kind of thing. You could buy them by the kilo. And I found some of the, just, you know, you'd find, you'd buy a kilo and you'd sort through it and you would find maybe three beads like this. So, I'm not going to dig them right out, dig them out right now because it'll take me too long to find it. And I know your schedule is busy, and you don't want to sit here waiting for, uh, in a video for me to find something that I need to find that I should have looked for before I brought I started the video. But in a future video, I will continue this and I will show you the full range of um, nail head beads with the Egyptian motif because they include little little squares with a sphinx head. They include uh, a little bead about this size with a salamander on it, all kinds of cool stuff. 
So I started out with the the uh, the goth like black black black, and I'm wearing black today, of course, with a little bit of I've got a necklace that's not black, but what can I say? Um, because I love I love the color black. Um, I love all thing uh, all things black too. I have a, a wonderful uh, what is this? Uh, satin pantsuit from the 70s that I'm about to put in a photograph and put in my uh, vintage shop on Etsy. And I have a do have a shop on Etsy called, in addition to my bead shop, I have another shop called Nun Blacker Vintage, as in from Spinal Tap. Um, they're talking about the album cover. They, they The Beatles did the White Album. They decide, this is a fictional band, of course, they decide to do an album that just has a black cover on it and they're looking at it going, oh, none more black. So I decided none black or vintage. And yes, I love vintage clothes, <clears throat> whether or not they have beads on them, often they do. And I love all colors of the rainbow, of course. Um, I do believe that black is beautiful in all, this, all, all the senses of the word. And I couldn't live in a world well, I, I'd ha I could if I had to, but I, I would really not want to live in a world without all colors of the rainbow in it. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I will get this out of the way so you can view my black, um, black sweater dress, whatever, also vintage, um, and this brass necklace, also vintage, because I love vintage things. And I hope to I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have a fabulous Halloween. If you've already had a fabulous Halloween, I'm glad you did. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Oops, I hit cancel instead of stop recording. Okay. It's official. Uh, come to see my next videos. I'm using my uh, my uh, Horror film narrator voice. Ooh, watch out. Don't let the uh, whatever's get you, you know, that kind of thing. Take it easy.